Hello. Greetings, Earthlings. I'm Cameron. And I'm Hunter. And we're from California Institute of the Arts, here to present our project, the Microbial Gardens. Zoos and aquariums, botanical gardens, nature documentaries, these types of major attractions encourage the public to engage with the wonders of the natural world. They're also some of the most effective tools we have to inspire people to care about conservation. But these attractions tend to celebrate organisms many of us are familiar with already. Birds and reptiles, fish and, fish and mammals. What would happen if we looked closer? What these curated displays of nature often overlook is an entire world of organisms living within our bodies, beneath our feet, and on every surface in this room. Microbes. They are in, they are in our water and in the air, vital to every process on Earth. Um, there are likely more types of microbes than there are of all vertebrates combined. One teaspoon of seawater alone contains approximately five million bacteria, and over half of the cells in our body are bacterial. Microbes have adapted to and inhabit every environment on Earth, and yet it's almost impossible to, and they, they also carry out the same dynamics as larger animals, and it's, yet it's almost impossible to appreciate them um, outside of a lab. With that in mind, we wanted to design an experience that liberates the world of the microbe from beneath the microscope and presents it at a human scale. The microbial gardens. This experience is a unique synthesis between a theme park and a botanical garden. But what truly sets it apart is that these human-made architectural structures function as a living ecosystem, complete with producers and consumers, competition and symbiosis, each concentric ring of pavilions functions as a different trophic level, and guests stroll amongst giant structures that illustrate the transfer of energy between living beings. Our garden is inspired not only by organismal biology, but by its systems and processes. It is an interactive food web. To enter, to enter the park, guests board trams that travel underwater through bioluminescent tunnels, gliding on natural slime pushed on by photosynthetic cells. At the heart of our architectural ecosystem is a microorganism called the diatom. Diatoms are a type of unicellular algae. They're abundant in nearly every habitat on Earth where water is found. Algae produce more than half of the oxygen in Earth's atmosphere and in doing so remove harmful greenhouse gases like CO2. But diatoms are unique among algae in that they're nature's most successful organism at exploiting sunlight. While the silicone-based solar cells we use today to capture about 30% of the sunlight that reaches Earth, diatoms are wildly more efficient, able to absorb almost all of the sunlight they come into contact with and convert it into energy. Their efficiency is owed largely to their structure. The small pores and complex symmetrical patterns combined with an anti-reflective coating allow light to flow into the organism without letting any of it escape. Labs around the world are developing solar cells that utilize diatoms to more effectively harness solar energy. The central garden of our park showcases a potential evolution of that technology. It's filled with structures that mimic the complex, light-capturing forms of diatoms coated in a paste of algal solar cells. These organic structures combine form and function to envision solar cells of the future, allowing us to display human-made structures that can photosynthesize like plants. These are the foundation of the microbial garden's food chain, generating energy that will be captured and utilized by other buildings throughout the park. These building size structures are um, microbial cathedrals, biological, biological cathedrals that showcase the world of the microbe at an unprecedented scale, replicating uh, microbial life as architecture. Um, they are based on the forms of radiolaria, microscopic zooplankton that leave behind intricate mineral skeletons. Um, the, these skeletons make up a massive portion of the Earth's ocean floor and are some of the most um, ancient and beautiful forms in nature, yet most people don't even know what they look like. Since radiolaria are both producers and consumers, 
these structures can generate some of their own energy, but also make, must take some of their energy from the diatoms, illustrating that trophic levels can have fuzzy boundaries. Inside of each one of these pavilions is a unique bacterial microbiome for visitors to interact with. Bacteria inside generate different colors, lights, and smells, so that each pavilion is a different sensory experience. At night, bioluminescent microbes bring the pavilions to life. These glowing structures contain bacterial cultures. When guests sit at the bar, the body heat they transfer to the surface of the chair is then converted into data, which could provoke a reaction in the bacterial colonies above. For example, more people sitting at the bar means more body heat, which could provoke a release of nutrients in the culture, causing it to gradually change color as new species thrive and feed. To keep bacterial growth in check, all cultures are kept contained, and occasionally a new species is released into the container to compete for resources or prey on colonies that are becoming too successful. Even the look, feel, and smell of the park would vary slightly day by day depending on the weather. Um, because the chart park changes tangibly based on user interaction and climate, it's impossible to have the same experience there twice. The upper levels of our microbial food web contain our consumers. If uh, the radiolaria and the diatoms are the grass of this ecosystem, then these organisms are the deer, the rotifers. Since rotifers cannot generate their own energy, these structures must rely on energy taken from the other pavilions. Standing inside one of these rotifer structures, visitors can look up through the mouth of the organism into a replica of its digestive tract, complete with complete with <laughs> uh, giant transparent organ structures filled with colorful bacterial life. Lastly, we have the predators of the microbial world, copepods. If these organisms are the deer of the bacterial landscape, then these microorganisms are the wolves. Because predators must hunt for their prey, the copepods are the only facet of the park that's mobile. Visitors climb aboard copepod ferries that move through the water from pavilion to pavilion, hunting and taking the energy they need from the park's other life forms to travel. Guests can see how energy is being used and distributed by the park on interactive displays that illustrate where each building or copepod has been feeding. They can see what percentage of the energy it's receiving came from the other pavilions versus how much energy it needed to take from the electrical grid. The microbial gardens are more than just a garden or a theme park. It's an experience that turns the invisible world visible, showing how essential and dynamic microbial life is. The park illustrates interactions fundamental to all ecosystems in nature, inviting people to participate in our evolving understanding of this unseen world. It also showcases how we can utilize microbiology to design a more sustainable future. This vision expands the notion of what biodesign is in that it not only models form based on biological inspiration, but also reproduces an entire biological process, encouraging thousands of people to participate. Thank you. Thank you so much, CalArts. Um, questions from our judges for CalArts Critical Studies. So I think it's a, it's a fabulously illustrated proposal. <laughs> and what I find fascinating is the way it mirrors a garden as an isolated uh, ecological moment. And yet your premise is about connectivity. So how have you considered the microbial garden handling the intrusion of microbes from everywhere else on the planet that are gonna be drifting through on the wind and in the water and on all the people coming through it? it itself is in a sort of going to be influenced and flavored by unexpected microbes. How, how did you consider that as part of the game of the garden? That was a part of our consideration in terms of keeping the bacterial colonies that we are intentionally genetic engineering or manipulating to generate lights and smells contained in sort of containers similar to chemotats. So nothing from the outside world can access what's happening on the inside world 
and we're sort of, it's very much so we're controlling what's happening with those microbes, but the microbes in the rest of the environment are, would continue to exist same as they do here or as in any other ecology. It's just that they won't be able to interact with the cultures that we are specifically designing. Yes, exactly. So I, I'd like to pick up on that same line of questioning. So you, you have lots of people visiting your park, using the bathroom in your park, touching the sculptures in the park. How does the human microbiome and the human um, microbial garden factor into the design of your microbial garden, or does it? Well, uh, visitors have the chance to, to interact um, through predetermined, like, designed functions. So, for example, if you have uh, heat sensors that sense where a person is in the space, you can have microbes that then respond to those types of influences, but not influences that are um, solely, like, random, like, like, that are less controllable, like um, what microbes exist on the person. I think that also, that was a big part of what inspired us with this project was the human microbiome and what exists within our bodies and in our gut. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the most important things about highlighting the microbial world in this way is that most humans don't even know about the microbiome within their own body, mm -hmm. um, let alone all over the planet existing in other forms of nature. So this park is a way to sort of encourage the public to care about something that they usually don't see, but that absolutely impacts their bodies, their everyday life. It's like, excite them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, because this is a group of people that are all interested in this subject matter, but most of the public is largely apathetic, and it takes attractions that inspire wonder and awe to engage people with something that they usually don't see in their day-to-day -day life. Yeah, I guess I wanted to ask um, kind of a, the reverse question, which is uh, what are the opportunities for people when they visit the park to, you know, take pieces of the park with them, either intentionally or un unintentionally, um, through the visits? And have you thought about that? And yeah. That's a really good question. Well, I'm, I'm sure we could have some sort of <laughs> gift shop where you can take <laughs> <laughs> home your very own species and specimens. <laughs> we, we hadn't thought about specific objects that people could take away, but we did think about different kinds of user interaction. Um, one thing that we were considering is maybe the paths between pavilions are covered in tiles that depress or react to visitors' footsteps. Uh, when they're depressed, maybe the tiles activate LEDs that would simulate growth in specific uh, pavilions. And, you know, or maybe the pavilions can direct traffic by sending luminescent, white, luminescent microbes or water shows into areas of the park that would benefit from more visitors. So there's certainly a lot of different ways we had sort of conceptualize this park as every part of it is an interactive experience that changes based on where bodies are and what the bodies are doing. This is a magnificent speculative space to be in. Um, you've described a lot of physical interactions that users can have with the space, but again, really thinking about the interactions that we have with our microbiomes, our, with the, the space that you've considered. Um, one of the areas that comes to light, I wonder if you've given any thought, is the impacts that these microbes can actually have on our physiology, right? We know there's a lot of connection between the mind and gut, um, and we know how different bacteria, different microbes can actually influence signaling factors in the body and how they can actually transform mood. Have you given any thought to that area? To be honest, no, but I love that line of thinking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love that, and I'd like to think about ways to implement that. Um, perhaps there are ways for people to sort of psychically manipulate what's happening in the bacterial colonies. Perhaps there are headsets that people can put on that would help them, you know, engage with the space. Okay, thank you so much.